and I know we're going to want to explore your war, uh, the uh, authorization for the use of force vote as well, but first let's go back to the students and see who else might have a question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Shaila Geary. I'm a sophomore in Stern studying finance and international business. Um, I had two questions about the 2006 election that are a little bit unrelated, but they're both about the election. Um, my first question was, in your own district, um, actually the Democrat candidate won, and so I was wondering what your feelings were about that, either disappointed or um, indifferent or excited. And I also had a question about um, the war in Iraq. The exit polls were citing that people um, who had turned out for the election, that the war in Iraq was one of the main reasons that they voted why they did. So I was wondering if you had any um, comments or suggestions about that issue. Okay, both very good questions. Well, here's my first public confession here, that I voted for the Democrat who took my seat in the House of Representatives. <laughs> I thought the Republican that we nominated was the worst possible. Uh, I'm, I'm biased, however. This individual ran against me two years ago in the Republican <laughs> primary. And we beat him with 56% of the vote. But for a non-incumbent, uh, for a challenger to an incumbent in a primary to get 44%, it was all on the immigration issue. And he was a Johnny One Note person on that. He was all just anti-immigration and on all the other social issues as well where I come down on the other side of. I knew from the moment that he not, was nominated that the race was over, that the Democrat was going to win. And the Republicans and the Democrats knew that as well. Interestingly enough, the Democratic DCCC, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, put $400,000 into the primary race to defeat the moderate Republican. They figured that was a good investment. They didn't have to spend a million dollars to try to elect the Democrat in the general election as a result of that. After they spent that $400,000, they didn't spend one penny in the general election, and the Republicans didn't spend one penny, and Gabby Giffords creamed him in the uh, general election, as I knew that, uh, that uh, she would there. So am I disappointed? Yeah, I would like to have been succeeded by a... Uh, uh, a Republican, but I guess maybe I can say it keeps my record intact of having been the, the uh, being the only Republican to represent Southern Arizona since statehood in 1912. No other <laughs> Republican has ever served in Congress from, from that part of the state there. So, uh, in that sense, I guess maybe my record's intact. And the second part of the question was on Iraq. I wished I had an answer to Iraq. I don't. Uh, I'm like many people. I was more convinced at the beginning we were doing the right thing. I thought the war could be short. I thought that, uh, I, I thought that once, the insurg once the military part of it was over, and I was quite convinced that it would, that part would turn out as it did. It was fairly quick. It was even quicker and easier than we thought it would be against Saddam Hussein. He put up less in a fight uh, than we thought. Um, but I think we thought after that that democracy really would begin to take hold. I, I don't think any of us really understood the depth, or most of us didn't, there were a few that did, but most of us didn't understand the depth of this, this insurgency or this, this division between the Shiites and the Sunnis and the Kurds, but particularly between the Shiites and the Kur Sunnis. The years of pent up hatred of the Shiites against the Sunnis for all the years of Saddam Hussein with their thumb uh, on him, on them. Uh, so, and, and it's all just kind of come to the, to come to the fore at this point. I don't know what the answer is today. I wish I could tell you that I saw an easy answer. I think the answer is going to be that they are going to have to get control of their own country and get control of that insurgency. We don't have a government there that seems willing, either able or willing, and I put as much emphasis on the willing as the able, able willing to be able to stop this insurgency. At some point, they're going to have to stare themselves in the mirror and say, if we don't, we're all going down here, and hopefully they will come to that conclusion uh, jointly. But meanwhile, keep in mind that much of the country is functioning pretty well. I mean, the north, the Kurdish part of the north is, is, going, is booming. Construction's booming, everything's going very well. Most of the area in the south is pretty quiet. It's Baghdad, and that's of course where all the news is, TV cameras and everything, and that's where we're, we're seeing all of this. Uh, and it's, it, it's a huge problem, and that's where the Shiites and the Sunnis come together and where the clashes uh, take place. But they're going to have to get control of this. I wished I had an easy answer to tell you how to do it. John McCain may be right. We're gonna, and he's way out on a limb on this. We're going to have to send more troops in order to do it, to get control of that.
if you had to do it over again, knowing what you know at this moment, if you had to do it over again, would you have voted the same way, that is, to authorize uh, the president to use force? If no, I don't think so, because of the, the vote was based on the weapons of mass destruction. We now know that most of that information was faulty, although I would again point out, I hope I'm not sounding too defensive, I point out that we know he did have those weapons of mass destruction. He used them against the Iranians. Uh, so they were there. Whatever he did in destroying them, which he, he always liked to play the game of never telling anybody, so we never knew what he had done uh, there. Uh, but no, I think probably I would not have uh, done that. But on the other hand, Saddam Hussein was going to be a bad player in this thing, if we, if we if staying around there. He was going to be trouble for us, and he was going to be trouble for the world. And he would have made, I believe, ultimately a connection with uh, Al-Qaeda. He would have made some connection there, and he would have become a base uh, for them. Okay, good, honest answer and thoughtful. Very good. Um, uh, any other questions from students? Okay, young man. So my name is Eric Colchmero. I'm a uh, student at the Wagner School, graduate student. Uh, two questions, um, well, two very different questions. When uh, Congressman Tom DeLay was here and had an interview, one of his quotes was that he said that Republicans during his leadership uh, govern from the right and then move to the center, as he could. Um, in your district, the last candidate seems like the person they nominated might have been, again, starting from the right, with someone with such a hardline immigration uh, perspective. Um, do you think, as a result of uh, the recent elections, that the Republicans will sense the need to change? Um, I mean, issues like gay rights, abortion, uh, will the Republicans move toward the middle, or is this leadership under the guidance of Karl Rove and a number of the training institutes, still starting at the right? Well, it, it's, a mat, it's a good question. And you may want to follow this up, so you might want to stay right there. But I, I, think the, uh, uh, I think the issue is whether or not you put it on the front burner. That was the problem. They kept not only putting this on the front burner, they kept putting it on the front burner over and over and over again. You know, having one vote on these things is one thing, but repeating it and doing it over again and rubbing the salt in people's wounds on this and making it seem like to the American people like this is the only thing that Congress was voting on was the mistake that we made. But do I think that the majority of the Republicans are going to suddenly shift on these issues? No. But I do, of course, Republicans are not going to be controlling the agenda in the House of Representatives or in the Senate now. But it's, they all came from the House of Representatives. But if they were, I think that this current leadership would be very unlikely to push those issues to the forefront again. Will they need to do it? in order to regain the majority? No, that would be a huge mistake. In fact, that'll guarantee they don't regain it if that's all they try to push. The American people are not interested in seeing those issues being pushed. They're interested in the economy. They're interested in fiscal discipline. They're interested in the war in Iraq and what we're going to do about those, those kinds of things. They're interested, I think, in entitlement reform. I think they're interested in immigration reform. They're interested in those things. And then second question, more larger scale. I was hoping uh, you can reflect on uh, health policy trends during your tenure, um, specifically during my lifetime, uh, the failure of the Clinton health policy plan, and then as well, um, it, even in the, this, uh, this past election where a number where the Democrats are going to regain the majority, there's still a number of moderate Democrats, a number of blue dogs who have come across. So there's going to need to be a, a moderate approach toward fixing the issue of the uninsured, and I'm wondering in the context of reflecting on health policy, um, what that solution might be? I don't know what the solution, thanks very much, John, for the question. I don't know what the solution is going to be, but um, uh, I don't think that we're going to see another huge, expensive program. And I think the reason for that is I think we used up all the dimes we had uh, with the prescription drug. And I think to add another one on top of that on the uninsured is going to be very difficult. States are moving in this area. They're doing some things on their own. And I think they'll continue uh, to do this. But I don't see us adding a, yet another layer onto this program. There's some very interesting stuff that's happening. It really and truly, one of the reasons that I voted for the prescription drug benefit was because of what we did in there on health savings accounts. I think that's going to transform health care in a way that very few people realize now. Uh, health savings accounts have been resisted by some of the liberals, Senator Kennedy most notably because I think he does understand exactly what it can do. If you're able to save some money for yourself, put it in a tax-free account, 
spend it tax-free on your out-of-pocket costs and have catastrophic coverage which picks up after the amount of your, 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 your resources are exhausted in that health savings account, you're not going to want to have another huge deduction for an insurance policy over there. You're going to like what you're going to see because we know that catastrophic coverage is, is, the, is not that expensive. It's the first dollar coverage. It's the time you go to the, hosp the doctor to get a toenail, ingrown toenail taken care of. It's the time you go for a checkup. That's the expensive part, uh, the most expensive part for the vast majority of people. And if you are able to cover that yourself with an, in a tax-free way with that, I think Americans are going to say, I want to keep this. I'm saving a lot of money for myself and for my family through this. Especially, it allows small employers to get involved where they can't, they can't afford to pay the insurance premiums, but they can get involved in matching a 50% match, a 100% match, whatever it be, matching some of the money you save in the health savings account, they can put that in for you there. So I think, I think that trend is one of the most significant that I see. And by the way, one thing that I think has turned out better than any of us expected is the prescription drug program. It's been much more popular, much more effective, and cost a lot less than anybody thought it was going to cost. And guess why? Competition. We actually have competition going on there. So I think it's worked. What do you think about the way uh, in which it was uh, passed? The way that the vote was held open for three hours and arms were twisted. Pretty much bad. Was, much was made about that uh, at the time. The, the, the process of twisting arms until you got that final vote uh, for three hours on the floor. It, 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 it was, it's certainly not pretty. But you know, there's the old saying that uh, if you have a weak stomach, you shouldn't wash sausages of laws being made. <laughs> uh, and I think there's a good deal of truth uh, to that. It certainly wasn't pretty, and there's never been a vote held open that long before. Uh, however, uh, votes have been held open under Republicans and Democrats for different periods of time while arms were twisted. And the reason this one was so difficult is that Nancy Pelosi was able to discipline the Democrats into voting against that thing in a very astonishing way that I don't think we expected. And so we had to go to the wells, literally and figuratively, the well of the House, and we had to go to the well for all of our votes to change some people that had absolutely committed to be against the thing and it became a very difficult vote uh, for them to to cast that vote and it was it was an extraordinary thing to watch it happen but do you think history will look back on that moment that e that evening well into the early morning which has been so widely criticized by experts who study the congress 10 20 years from now and say good for them well, I, I don't think there's any magic to the 15-minute vote. I mean, I'm sure I like to have these votes over and get moving on to the next thing. None of us like to sit around there and wait for, for that to happen. But I, I think that it's the, uh, I think it was the, I don't think, no, I don't think they'll look back on that and say, this was a terrible thing. This has any long-term impact on Congress as an institution.